Thank you for tuning in to RTM Nation Online, where we believe that you will receive the abundance of peace, prosperity, security, stability, health, healing, and truth. If you would like to learn more about the ministry, click the link below. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Now let's get into the message. Glory to God. Before you sit, let me just say this to you. Really want to Im impact you with the understanding that Jesus is here. What does that mean? Look, if, 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 if I said Barack Obama was here, Barack Obama's in the foyer. We just set in a certain atmosphere so that he can come in. You know, your expectations would change, right? Your expectations would change. Jesus is here. Hallelujah. Yeah. And that, you know, so yeah, we praise, he inhabits the praises of his people, but what I believe he wants us to do is jack up our expectation. I'm not just turn up your expectation, not just expect more. No, we need to jack it way up. Jesus is here. The same Jesus that opened blind eyes, the same Jesus that made the lame walk, the same Jesus that turned two fish and five loaves into a meal that fed over 5,000, that same Jesus is here. That same loving Jesus, that same Jesus that met Paul on the Damascus, Paul the murderer, that same Jesus that met him on the road and converted him, that same Jesus is here. Same Jesus that saved you, saved me is here, is present. Hallelujah. Our expectation is to receive from him. Listen, I'm teaching, but I'm expecting to receive from him too. Don't, just, don't set your expectation on the teacher. Set your expectation on Jesus. You set your expectation on Jesus, you receive things beyond what I can do. You set your expectation on Jesus, you receive beyond the spoken word. You receive a fresh word for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I want to eat some living bread. I want to eat some living bread. I want to drink some living water. I want some of the stuff that Jesus told the lady at the well about. You sip from my cup and you'll never be thirsty again. I want that kind of water. I want the kind of bread that I can eat from this bread and never be hungry again. I want that type of satisfying grace to come into my life. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. I got expectation to eat from what he's prepared for me. He's prepared a meal for me today. He's prepared a table for me today. And I want to sit at that table. And I want to eat and fellowship with him at that table, the table of grace, to be impacted and be in cha changed and empowered to do things that I couldn't do in my own ability, to see things beyond my natural sight. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I got great expectation today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The house is full. This house is full, full of the presence of God. <laughs> Glory to God. Full of his presence, full of his power. Glory to God. Glory to God. <laughs> yes. Glory to God. Glory to God. Woo. That's some good stuff right there. Hallelujah. We're talking about... Some folks can get healed in an atmosphere like this. Some things can change for real in an atmosphere like this. Hallelujah. Jesus is here. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Jesus is here. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's good stuff. Expect to experience him. Expect to experience him. Raise your expectation because Jesus is here. <laughs> Jesus is here. Expect to be filled. Expect to be filled. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
Expect to be filled, flooded. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Go ahead and love on the person next to you. Hallelujah. And then you can be seated. God is good God. Hallelujah. He is still working. Faith is still working. Faith is active. Faith is in operation and still working. Jesus is a good friend. He hears your prayers. You know, um, so I was about 13 years old, and I had asthma. And um, I've shared the story before. I know my mom was praying for me, and our situation changed where, where we need, we, you know, I mean, medication and your inhalers and your pumps and all of that can only do so much, right? And uh, we were in a position where we didn't have, we didn't have medication. We didn't have um, a pump or any of that. And uh, we needed God. <laughs> we needed Jesus. And I was 13, and I was about tired of it. I mean, I had grown up, and, you know, those of you that had asthma or bronchitis or you know somebody who did, you know how it is. You go play outside. If the weather's changed a little bit, it's a little colder than normal. You know, I remember having to stop playing and sit to the side. I remember going to a friend's house for a sleepover. We're at a sleepover, and we're playing and having a good time. And... Um, my friend, he, he, you know, he was a good friend. He cared about me, and he noticed my breathing had changed. And we're little kids. We're in elementary school. And, and he made me sit down and got his mom, and um, my mom, his mom called my mom. And I remember my mom having to come over. I don't remember what time it was, but it was late. And uh, she had to come and bring my, my medication. Um, but I remember growing up with them type of situations, having a, you playing flag football and you got to stop because you can't breathe. Well, we got here, I was about 12 or 13 years old and I had enough of it, enough, is, enough of this. Now, we were going to church, you know, I wonder, you know, I was just going to church because that's what my family did. But I had heard enough to, to know to pray. So I got on my knees one night, literally, Got on my knees, that's how I learned to pray, you know. That's how I was praying. Got on my knees before I went to bed. And I didn't know the words to say to make it sound all special. So I just said, I've had enough of this. No more asthma, God. Take this away. And I went to bed that night. I woke up the next day, never had a problem since. Never had a problem since. Because he's present. He's aware of you. He's a healer. Amen. Amen. Faith is still active. Faith works. Faith works for you. A few weeks ago, maybe a month or so now, now, uh, Mackenzie and I were in the car. We're going to pick Unika up from work. And it just started raining. And, you know, it would mean one of them torrents would come real, I mean, pouring down, raining. And I'm like, man, I don't want my wife to get wet, you know. I'm trying to figure out what can I do. And uh, I know what to do. I'm going to speak to this rain. So I I just said, I looked out the windshield and I pointed to the sky and said, stop raining. Well, it kept raining. I said, I don't care. I'll practice. I'll practice. I don't care, you know. Well, we got to the place where we were picking her up. And, um, you know, I parked my car. I figured I'd park, you know, in a place where she can get in quick. You know, I think, I don't know where the umbrella was. We just bought a new umbrella because we lose them. <laughs> so maybe we didn't have it or whatever. But so I, I kind of forget about things. I'm in the moment now. She's getting in the car. And um, 
She gets in the car, sits down, and I'm looking at her. I'm expecting her to be wet. I mean, it's pouring down, raining. I look at her, I don't see no wet. <laughs> She's dry. And, and I mean, this happens all in a, in, inside of a second. I realize that she's dry. And then I notice, I don't hear no rain on the car. No raindrops. I don't hear no rain. But I look out the window, and I can see rain. I'm like, what in the world? She got in the car. She closed the door. And right after she closed the door, boom, I hear the rain. I say, it stopped raining. <laughs> she didn't know what I was talking about, but Mackenzie did. I said, I said, I said, I told her to stop raining and to stop raining. And I looked at Mackenzie, I said, Mackenzie, then, and she said, yeah, daddy told her to stop raining, it stopped raining. But the thing was, it was raining everywhere else, but on our car. I could see the rain. I'm, we're looking out the window, and I finally said to her, I told her, was that? I said, you see it's rain. We can see the rain, but it wasn't raining over us. <laughs> Amen. 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 Faith is still active. Yes, sir. Faith is still working. Yes, sir. Jesus is still healing. Yes, sir. Faith is still active and working. Yes, sir. It isn't something that we left in Bible times. Yeah. Faith is still active. Faith is still working. Yes, sir. Jesus is still healing. Jesus is still ministering. Amen? Amen. Activate your faith. I want you to raise your expectations. Amen? Amen. 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 Glory to God. All right. Let's get into this. Y'all ready to hear the word of God? Glory to God. Hallelujah. So um, the message title today is The Source of Our Prosperity. The Source of Our Prosperity. We've been talking about God's way to prosper us, God's systems of provision, And um, it brought us up to here last week. We left off getting ready to enter into a story, the the account of Joseph. As we read the account of Joseph, we're going to point some things out um, um, that we can still apply to our lives today. One of the things that we learned was that, you know, God is the God of the supernatural. Say amen to that. But God is also the God of the natural. And oftentimes what happens is we learn the spiritual things, we learn the supernatural things, and it will cause us to forsake the natural things. But the two go together. God created both systems, the natural and the supernatural. We read Ecclesiastes chapter 11, and it tells us to give, cast your bread or your provision upon the water, it will come back to you. And he says, you know, give a portion to seven and even to eight. But you don't know which one is going to prosper. It tells us to give and also work with your hand. What does that mean? It says give. That's the that's you laying up treasures in heaven, but also work with your hands. Give, participate in the supernatural system of provision, but also work. The two go together. We read um, scriptures from the book of Proverbs that talked about us being diligent in our work. Right. Not being slack with our hands, not being idle, not being lazy. We read a scripture in the book of Titus where Paul is encouraging Titus to teach our people how to work well, teach them how to be diligent at their work, teach them that they should have. um, What does he call it? Profit, profitable labor. Okay, so we can't forsake the natural because we're so spiritual. What we're learning is that. The spiritual, your spiritual, if you are spiritually mature, then your spiritual maturity should roll over into your natural work. Because I am spiritual, I'm excellent in this natural system. You understand that? So one of the greatest examples of that is Joseph. Joseph had this connection with with God. He was here from God. He received the the promise of his generations. He received the promise of his father, the promise of his grandfather. Here he is. He's carrying out. And now he's the carrier of that promise. And his spiritual connection caused him to behave a certain way in the natural. And we see Joseph prosper because of it. He prospered spiritually. The promise that God gave him came to pass. 
and he prospered naturally. He was a very blessed and prosperous man. So we'll look at the account of Joseph and pull some things out that we can apply to our own lives. Amen. 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 Let's start in Genesis 37, starting at verse number two. I'm just going to read through some of this. Starting at verse number two from the Amplified, it says, this is the history of the descendants of Jacob, and this is Jacob's line. Joseph, when he was 17 years old, Joseph, when he was 17 years old, he was a teenager. So age or, you know, sometimes we we limit ourselves because of a lack of experience. We there are things that we, you know, we'll say that, you know, we will disqualify ourselves from things because of a lack of experience. We will project future success after we have qualified experience or after we have experience that qualifies for that level of success. We'll say stuff like, you know, I will lead once I get my degree or once I have this, or I'll qualify for this, you know, um, I'm looking at some educators in the room, you know, I'll be qualified to be a principal after I go through these steps. I'll be qualified to be a supervisor after I go through, after I have these experiences. Or we will, we will, um, we will keep ourselves in a position. We'll say in our minds, the reason that I'm just at this level is because I don't have that experience that will qualify me for that level. And we'll stay where we are because we've disqualified ourselves based on experience. But Joseph was 17. Joseph was 17. What experience did he have? Joseph was 17. And we're going to see the call, the assignment the promise that God gives Joseph, and he was just 17. Mm -hmm. Don't disqualify yourself. Don't disqualify yourself. As a matter of fact, if you're in Christ, then qualify yourself. You're qualified. Say, I'm qualified. I'm qualified. What you're believing for ain't based on the natural system anyway. You qualify in Christ. You qualify. Amen. You qualify. You qualify. Don't disqualify yourself because of your age. Young or old, doesn't matter. You're in Christ. You're in Christ. You're in Christ. Amen. Amen. You you're in Christ. You operate. You're in a natural system, but you are supernatural. You're supernatural. The things that limit someone that's in the natural don't limit you. Amen. You govern your life based on spiritual principles. There is no age qualifications in spiritual things. In the spirit, all of us ancient. When did your spirit begin? I believe all our Spiritually, all our spirits began way back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, when God said, let us make man. Boom. All of us, all billions of us, we just stood in line waiting to get in the body. That was it. Don't limit yourself because of your age. Don't disqualify yourself because of your age. Don't think I'm too young. Don't think I'm too old. That's how natural people think. You're spiritual. You hear what I'm saying to you? You live a life of faith. Faith doesn't consider none of that. It don't matter for faith. It doesn't matter. Do you understand what I'm saying? It doesn't matter for faith. Faith don't care how old you are. You think faith cares? Faith Faith ain't considering that. Abraham, Sarah, 
Zechariah, Elizabeth. Faith don't care. I never saw Jesus ask somebody, how old are you? How old are you? Wait, before you get this healing, how old are you? Faith don't care. Glory to God. You're qualified. Say, I'm qualified. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So here Joseph is, 17 years old. He's shepherding the flock with his brothers. The lad was with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's secondary wives, and Joseph brought his father a bad report of them. See, Joseph was a faithful steward over what he was trusted with. Joseph was a faithful steward over what he was entrusted with. The question is, are you a faithful steward over what you've been trusted with? Are you faithful to what's been put in your hands? Notice that Joseph didn't compromise. Joseph didn't compromise because of his company. Joseph didn't compromise the quality of his stewardship because of his company. Joseph wasn't trying to please his peers. He didn't compromise on his standard, on the standard that he was, he was living at. He didn't compromise based on his peers. He didn't compromise. He didn't slack off because his peers were slacking off. You know, he didn't slack off because his co-workers slacked off. He didn't take the extra time in lunch because everybody else was taking the extra time in lunch. He didn't mismanage the materials or the resources placed in his hands because his peers were mismanaging materials and the resources put in their hands. And they said, hey, you know, that's just how we do it around here. Joseph didn't compromise. Joseph didn't compromise. Joseph didn't compromise. He lived up to a higher standard. He lived up to a higher standard. We have to find ourselves in that same place where we're living up to a higher standard. There are things that I'm not going to do because I'm not I'm not compromising. Amen. I'm not going to compromise. I'll live up to a higher standard. I'm not here to please my peers. I've been trusted with something. If I'm working for a company, that company has trusted me with the time that, you know, we were at um, uh, my wife and I went to get something to eat and um, witnessed some folks there that are working at a restaurant, taking a break. Remember that? And they must not was supposed to be taking a break. I mean, it was a, about five, seven of them. And the manager came outside of the restaurant into the parking lot and checked them all. She's like, if you, are, if you have on a such and such uniform and you're on such and such time, you need to be inside working, right? And everybody quickly got up, and those who were supposed to be at work went to work. What were they doing? They mis- they, they're misusing somebody else's time. Yes, sir. Right? But not us. We live on a higher standard. Amen? Amen. Amen. So Joseph lived on a higher, higher standard. He was faithful. He was a faithful steward over what he was trusted with. Okay, and he was not willing to compromise his stewardship for friendship. He wasn't willing to compromise his stewardship for friendship. We know there's a scripture that says to be a friend of the world is to be an enemy um, of God. And what what it's saying is that if you're trying to please people and trying to please God at the same time, you'll come to the point of compromise. There will be a conflict of interest there. Okay. Joseph decided that he was going to please God. Joseph decided that he was going to please God. Even if that sets me against my peers, I'm here to please God. Do you understand that? And we'll see later. I'm going to say it now. The thing that gave Joseph the fortitude, the inner strength to make that stance was because he had a vision. If I see myself, and this is this is how I, I approach my work, I see myself, I, promotion is on me. Promotion is on me. So I don't care what the position is I'm in today, promotion is on me, and I know I need to act in a certain way towards my peers because one day I'm going to be your supervisor. So even though we're on the peer level, I'm not really trying to be your friend because one day I'm going to be giving you directions. Joseph approached his work like that. He, was, he, he had a vision of where he was going, okay? 
So I'm not going to get comfortable. I'm not going to settle at where I am today because I see where I'll be tomorrow. So I live today based on where I see myself tomorrow. I'm not living today based on the circumstances of today. I'm living today based on where I see myself going. That's faith. I'm not going to wait till I get there to act like I'm there. No, I believe I receive it right now, so I'm going to act like it today. Do you understand? If you understand that, say amen. Amen. Verse 3 says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. That's what he said, but I believe it was because of how the boy worked. It had something to do with how he worked. It had something to do with his good habits. I mean, you've trusted your, your sons with, with your sheep and your possessions, and, you know, they messing around. Joseph comes home and say, Daddy, look, they messing around, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened. Joseph got some favor with Jacob because he, he was a good steward. If he was the son of his old age and messing up, messing stuff up, I bet you Jacob wouldn't have been as favorable to him. But because he was a good steward and faithful over what he was trusted with, he had favor in his father's eyes. You see that? So he made him a, a, a long, distinctive tunic with sleeves, right? Because your faithfulness will bring you favor even in the natural system. Yes, yes. Your faithfulness will bring you favor even in the natural system. Okay? I've had employers, you know, I, I go to my supervisors and I'll say, you know, um, you know, that conference that I went to last year is coming up again. I remember the first time I had to go to my a supervisor and tell him that I wanted to go on a, to a conference, a week long conference. Now, I'm valuable. I'm valuable at my place of work. Right. I understand that. And I know they're not easily just going to let me go. They need me every day. How many of you that type of employee? You should be that employee. No, we want you around here every day as much as possible. So that was me, right? But, you know, conference is coming up, and I want to go to this week-long conference. Okay, so I'm praying about how do I let my supervisor know I want to go to this week-long conference. Holy Spirit had to remind me of my value. And Holy Spirit reminded me, how did you get this valuable? How did you, how did you become who you are to them? Because I learned what I, it's stuff at this conference. Well, this conference is valuable. And this conference is valuable to them. If the things that you'll learn at this conference help you be who you are, then what you're learning at that conference is of value to them. Just let them know that. So I went to them and I said, you know, there's a conference coming up. It's a week long conference. I'm going to take some time off. I like to take some time off to go. And these are the type of things that I learned at this conference. You know, I learned I've learned some leadership things and who I am today is because of this right here. So is it okay if I take this time off to go to this conference? Sure. No problem. Right? So what did I say? So your faithfulness will bring you favor even in a natural system. Your faithfulness will bring you favor even in a natural system. Okay? Let's pick up at, um, at verse 5. It says, now Joseph had a dream. Joseph's dream accompanied the promise <laughs> Joseph's dream accompanied the promise. Why am I saying that? The dream had value. The dream was significant only because the dream was connected to the promise. If you back up to Genesis chapter 12, we see God give a promise to Abraham. I'm going to make you Great. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to make you into a great nation. You'll be a dispenser of good. You will be blessed. Your family will be blessed. Your family will bless other families. By your family, the blessedness on your family, all of the families of the earth will be blessed. That's the promise. The promise was generational. The promise passed from Abraham to Abraham's son, Isaac. That promise passed from Isaac to Jacob, and from Jacob to Joseph. So the family has a promise. The dream accompanied 
the promise. The dream was just a vehicle that the promise would be fulfilled. Do you understand that? So the dream has value. The dream is significant because the dream accompanies the promise. So Joseph dreams a dream and he tells it to his brothers and they hated him all the more. And he said to them, listen here, I pray you listen to this dream that I've dreamed. And he tells them the dream. You should have a dream. You should have a dream. You should have a dream or vision or you should have a picture, an image of what God is doing in your life. You should be able to see your end even from the beginning. You should be able to see your end. You should practice. I practice my vision. I practice the vision, meaning I spend time imagining and visualizing the end that God has promised. I visualize the promise coming to pass in my life. If you're here and you say, well, you know what? The truth be told, I don't have a vision. Listen, let me make it real clear to you. When you became a member of this church, church is not a building. Church is a people. When you came into this group of people, you came into a vision. You came into a promise. We are a group of people who have been given a promise. We say, well, what's the promise? The promise is Jeremiah 33 and 6. That's a promise. I know we've referred to it as the vision, and you know, we, if someone asks, what's the vision of your church? We say Jeremiah 33 and 6. That's only because the vision accompanied the promise. Jeremiah 33 and 6 is a promise. God's promise to reveal his abundance of peace prosperity, security, stability, health, healing, and truth. That's his promise to us. God has promised us that he will reveal, he will manifest to us peace, prosperity, security, stability, health, healing, and truth. That's his promise to us. That's good news, isn't it? The dream, the vision, just accompanies the promise. What that means is the vision for my life is just the vehicle that will be used to manifest the promise. The dream Joseph had, Joseph dreamed about some lean cows and some fat cows. That, who cares about the cows? It wasn't real cows. The cows, the, that wasn't important. What the dream really was saying was that Even if there's famine, Joseph, I'm still going to provide for you and your family because I promised it. Because I promised it. Even when, and we've talked about it before, even when this earthly system falls and decays and it's corrupt and it changes, when changes happen around you, don't be moved by what happens in this natural system because I've given you a promise that is not subject to this natural system. The promise that I've given you is upheld by heaven. That's what the dream was about. That's what the dream meant. That's the message that God is relaying to Joseph. Don't worry about the famine. I got you. And that's what God is relaying to us. Don't worry about the stuff that happens in this natural world. I promised you prosperity. I promised you peace. I promised you stability. I promised you security. I promised you health. I promised you healing. I promised that you'll walk in truth. I promised these things to you. Glory to God. Ain't that good news? That's good news. Well, praise him then. It's good news. Give him some praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. So Joseph receives this dream that's founded on a promise. In uh, verse 18, it says this. And when they saw him from afar off, talking about his brothers, his brothers saw him from afar off. Even before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They wanted to get rid of him. You know, you dream and you promise and all that. You know, they were hating on him. And they said one to another, see, here comes this dreamer and master of dreams. So come on now, let us kill him and throw his body into some pit. 
then we will say to our father, see, you think people are against you. You've been crying and complaining to God because of little people that's saying stuff about you and people that's doing stuff about you. And you, you got some, uh, you know, some type of complex because people didn't like what you posted on Facebook and all of this stuff. Joseph's brother's kill, trying to kill him. Joseph's brothers want to take him out. I mean, you talk about somebody hating on you. They re- hating on him for real. They don't want to key his car. They ain't trying to hide his favorite hat. They planning to kill him. You know, goodness. How does Joseph respond to that? Look at verse 23. When Joseph had come to his brothers, they stripped him of his, his, his garment. They took him and cast him into a well or pit. Then they sat down to eat their lunch. Ooh, wee. When they looked up, behold, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels. They're going down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, what do we gain if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let our hand not be upon him, for he is our brother in our flesh. And his brothers consented. And then as the Midianites and Ishmaelites were passing by, the brothers pulled Joseph out of the pit and they sold him for 20 pieces of silver. And the Ishmaelites took Joseph captive into Egypt. So Joseph is now on his way into Egypt as a purchased slave. And the Midianites and the Ishmaelites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, and the captain and chief executioner. That's an important part not to just read over real quick. This man was the chief executioner, right? He was like the warden, okay? Now let's skip to chapter 39. So Joseph is brought down to Egypt. Chapter 39, verse 2. You got it? What does it say? But the Lord was with Joseph. So this man, his family is hating on him. He has a promise. He has a dream. He's sold as a slave, brought to Egypt. But the Lord is with him. The Lord is with him. And he, though a slave, was a successful and prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. So here Joseph is, a slave, taken away from his family, sold into slavery. He's an employee in Potiphar's house, but the Lord is with him, and he's successful, and he's prospering. Stop complaining about where you are and realize who's with you, where you are. Doesn't matter where I am, as long as I'm aware of who I'm with, (laughs) who you with. (laughs) It doesn't matter where I am. The Lord being with me. It doesn't matter. I can be at the bottom of the totem pole. I can be entry level. None of that matters. The Lord being with me. I can be employed, unemployed, retired, self-employed. The Lord being with me, I'll prosper wherever I am. I expect to prosper wherever I am, the Lord being with me. Amen. The Lord being with me. Glory to God. Go ahead and say, the Lord, the Lord is, with me. is with me. Joseph prospered because the Lord is with him. Glory to God. That's good, good news. Yeah. Hallelujah. Let's look at verse 3. It says, and his master saw that the Lord was with him. You see that? The heathen Egyptian saw that the Lord was with him. I've had some heathens recognize that the Lord is with me. Amen. Just got favor. Everything I ask him to do, he gets it done, gets it done early, gets it done well, and then ends up doing more than I asked him to do. The Lord is with him. Yeah. I don't do all that church stuff 
but this must be something to it because the Lord is with you. <laughs> the Lord is with them. You see that? The master saw that the Lord was with him. It's time for people around you to see that the Lord is with you. Amen. It's time for people around you to see that the Lord is with you. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. And that the Lord made all that he did to flourish and succeed in his hand. What's in your hand? I want you to say that to the person next to you. What's in your hand? Glory to God. Now, this is the good stuff right here. What's in your hand? Potiphar, the heathen employer, not only did he notice that Joseph prospered in all that he did, he noticed the Lord was with them. He noticed that whatever I put in his hand prospers. Whatever he puts his hands on prospers. I want, I want you to know that you operate in that same blessing, that same anointing. The difference is, the difference is, the, way that, the reason that we don't see it, the way that it should be seen, is because we judge what's in our hands. I should say we misjudge what's in our hand. We qualify and disqualify our success based on what we see as it being in our hands. What, I'm, what, I'm, what do you mean what's in your hands? What's your opportunity right now? What's your position right now? What's your title right, right now? What's your work right now? What job do you have right now? Don't overlook what God has put in your hand right now because it doesn't look like what you want or even what he's shown you. Don't forsake what you have in your hands right now because God will prosper what's in your hands right now. Amen. And I know you might look at what's in your hands right now and say it doesn't amount to nothing. According to who? Who said so? Whose judgment are you listening to? You've disqualified what you're doing right now based on whose judgment. Maybe you're not really seeing what the right now assignment is. Maybe your actions are nothing more than, you know, flipping burgers or, or, or cleaning up or taking out trash. Maybe that's the, 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 the duties, the tasks that you have to do. But the assignment that God gave you may be way greater than that. But if you disqualify it because of what you're doing right now, because of the task, then you never get to the place where you get to see and others get to see the Lord working with you in what's in your hands right now. I think it's empowering to know that God will prosper what's in my hands even right now. I've been in positions myself where I was looking past what I had right now, looking into what was coming or what I wanted to come. And Holy Spirit has taught me, no, don't forsake what's in your hands right now. Yes, sir. Amen. That means that I'm not, my effort and my energy isn't so much trying to get to the next place because I can prosper where I am right now. I don't have to, I'm not going to miss out on the opportunity that I've been given because of the opportunities that I see ahead. Yeah, and I thank God that he shows you what's down the road, but he doesn't show you what's down the road for you to forsake what's in your face right now. He shows you what's down the road so that you seeing that can change what you do right now. Because I see that I'm a king down there, I can act kingly Right here, because I see Joseph, because I see that I'm going to be ruling and in charge of all of this down there, I can be a faithful steward right here. I'm going to be faithful leading all of Egypt. So I'm definitely going to be faithful leading Potiphar's house. If I'm going to rule the greatest nation in the world then my God, I'm going to rule this man's bedroom. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure that this, this thing this is going to be nice. Because if I can't govern the house, how am I going to govern the nation? 
if I can't bring order and have an orderly classroom, how am I going to bring order to the whole school? If I can't bring order to my bedroom, then what is it going to look like when I get my own house? If I can't be faithful over someone else's business, the small part that they put in my hand, then what am I really going to do when I have my own? Shift in perspective. What's in my hands right now is very important. What's in my hands right now is of great value. What's in my hands right now represents where I'm going. So I'm going to be faithful over this. I'm going to be faithful over this much because this is the much that's going to take me to the much more. I'm not looking past what's in my hands right now. I'll be faithful over what's in my hands right now. How can he who is unfaithful in the little be trusted with that which is much? How can you be trusted with the whole kingdom when you're not faithful over the little bit, the little smallest part of the kingdom or what's in the kingdom? It, that's a rule. That's a law, a law that can be applied in every area of your life. I want to be trusted with the whole kingdom. Forget money. God told me some years ago, he said, you build buildings without money. You build buildings without money. It's not about money. It ain't about money. I want the true riches. Amen. I want the true riches. But if you can't be faithful with this money, how are you going to get to the true riches? What you have in your hand right now is important. The opportunity that's in front of you right now, right now will open doors to opportunities that you can't even see, you never even imagined. But if you're slack in what you have right now, and it's not that God will be upset with you, and it's not that you will disqualify yourself for promotion or anything like that, it's not a place to be in fear, it's a place to understand that God, again, is more concerned with me than this end result that I see. So God is more concerned with my development. God wants me to develop to the place that I am a ruler. No matter where you put me, I'm going to rule. No matter where you put me, I'm going to end up being in charge. You can bring me in at the very bottom. I'm going to be leading the people right here at the bottom because lead is in me. It's who I am. I've developed leadership, and I don't care where you put me, what group you put me in, I'm going to end up leading it because it's in me. It's just who I am. But if I don't develop leadership, if I don't develop faithfully where I am, then I won't develop into who he sees me being for the next, for the next. You know, and even, listen, the, the thing that you see, the goodness that you desire, it's going to come from you. It comes, it's from you. It's by your faith. God never does anything in our lives absent of faith. It comes out of you. There's, there's a scripture that says that God placed eternity in the hearts of men. God's placed eternity in the hearts of men. So that future vision that you have, he placed it there. It's a glimpse of your future. It's coming out of you. Your faithfulness your stewardship over what you have now is you becoming who you see in the future. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Joseph had this understanding. He had this revelation. He was faithful over what was put in his hands. He, you know, he could have been like, you know what, I'm not doing nothing but managing my daddy's sheep. But he didn't take that approach. I'm going to be faithful in managing my daddy's sheep. And because he was faithful in managing his daddy's sheep, when he got to Potiphar's house, I could run this man's house. And he prospered, the Lord being with him. Amen? Amen. Amen. We'll stop right there, and we'll pick up next week. Amen? Amen. The Lord is with you. Glory to God. Stand on your feet. We pray that today's message was a blessing to you. 
If you would like to help us further expand the vision, simply text the word GIVERTM to the number 41444 or visit us online at www.revealingtruth.org. Now remember, Jesus loves you.